Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. It is the beginning of the school year, and teachers and students are both going back wide-eyed and ready for a great school year. We have certainly a lot of great things happening here on TeacherCast. Of course, the big news is that our live program, the Tech Educator Podcast, is going to be moving from our Sunday night at 7 o'clock spot, which we've covetly held for the last 138 episodes. We are going to be moving starting the middle of September on to Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So check us out over on TeacherCast.tv. We have a great few, uh, a great amount of shows coming up uh, at the beginning of September there. So again, that's Tech Educator Podcast is moving to September on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Of course, there's a lot of other great things happening on TeacherCast with our educational podcasting channel and all of the amazing blog posts that we're having. We're certainly still looking for great content writers. If you are an educator out there looking to share your passions with everybody, check us out over on TeacherCast. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about digital technology and how your students can survive the transition from being amazing little boys and girls to technologically advanced graduates. Today, my guest is Dr. Corinne Hyde. She is the uh, she works at the USC Rossier School of Education. And today we're going to be talking a lot about digital literacy and how your students can not only play safe, but be active in the digital community. I want to welcome in Dr. Hyde today. Corinne, welcome to the show. Welcome to TeacherCast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I love this topic, and we're certainly going to be talking about things like digital literacy, social media, ways to keep our kids safe. But I want to start to ask you, why are we talking about this topic today? Why is it so important that as the school year starts, we are focusing on digital literacy? Well, I would say it's really critical because as I'm sure everybody is aware, you have technology integrated more and more and more into every aspect of our daily lives. Um, you know, even 10 years ago, we didn't have smartphones everywhere with us all the time. We weren't constantly accessing social media. And so uh, the landscape in terms of technology in general just looks completely different than it did even a very short time ago. And so students are now, um, growing up in this completely different technological environment, and we need to know how to address that. Uh, we want to be able to address our students as whole people. And so that includes this technological element, uh, regardless of whether you're a big tech fan or not, uh, we have to know how to address that in the classroom, how to make sure we are growing global citizens that are digitally literate and so um if we're going to do that we have to talk about digital literacy you know i, I love what you're saying of growing digital citizens you know this yeah. isn't something that a teacher can just flip the switch on and, and I, we're going to get right. into these topics of ways to do this in the school and hopefully ways to maybe not do this in the school <laughs> but let's talk a yeah. little bit about yourself why are we here today and, and what is your background with this topic uh, mm -hmm. from a professional side i can see behind you you clearly have changed children, and this is an important topic to yes. all parents. Uh, give us a little bit of background on yourself and, and how we got here. So I am currently an associate professor of clinical education at uh, the Rossier School of Education at uh, USC in Los Angeles, uh, but I actually live in Louisiana. I'm a distance educator. So by necessity, I have to be very involved with uh, educational technology on a daily basis. I've been teaching at a distance for the last seven years. And that has brought with it just a wealth of experience in terms of educational technology, because I've had to find ways to really connect with students globally. We enroll students in our master's and doctoral programs all over the world. So I might be running a class session live over webcam, just like we're talking here right now, but I'm talking to students in Dubai and students in Berlin and students in Michigan and students in Hawaii and all over the place at the same time. And somehow we have to make a connected community of learners all at the same time. When we're, so, when, when we're looking at this, what skills are you suggesting people have? Uh, well, probably the first big, um, the first big question I get um, when people find out what I do is, well, isn't this depersonalizing education? Isn't this just, or, or isn't it, uh, doing the teacher's job or whatever it is. And I, I try to always emphasize to people that technology 
whatever you are referring to, whether it's iPads or desktops or what have you, it's just a tool. It's just a tool for learning. And teachers need to be literate in using that tool and students need to be literate in using these tools, just like they would be literate using encyclopedias in the library back when I was a kid. But, um, but, so, but, but Corinne, yes, <laughs> I, I have, I have lesson plans to do. I have I things at home when I'm off the clock and you're not paying me for that. And, and no. I have, I have to teach a curriculum and I, <laughs> I don't have time as a teacher to learn about this stuff. And, you know, yeah. those kids, they know much more about me about this stuff anyway. Uh, I'm yeah. sure they already know it. Yes. And, you know, I once was a classroom teacher not that long ago. I was a classroom teacher in LA Unified School District, and I had those pacing plans coming out to me. And they said, you're going to do this on this day and this on that day. And I completely understand that sentiment of when, when are you going to fit this in? And what I have found both as a K-12 classroom teacher and as now as a professor is that if you can actually get your hands dirty with the technology, if you can do some experimentation, be willing to step out on the lead a little bit, that not only are you going to get very robust educational experiences, but your students are likely to become more engaged and motivated in what you're doing, which is a big time saver for you because you're not spending all of your time trying to pull them into whatever it is. You have an automatic in for a lot of students just by using technology. Uh, but then also there are a lot of ways to do things online that actually end up saving you time in the long run because number one, you can set things up ahead of time that you can reuse. You can have students engaged in ways that are more robust learning experiences for you but require less hands-on time uh, or more robust learning experiences for them but more less hands-on time for you um and you don't have to be the sole source of knowledge for them in the classroom now they can connect with this global network of experts but, but and but, they can engage and get knowledge from everywhere instead of always having to bring the question to you but, but Corinne, look, I've been teaching this way for 25 years. I've got yeah. three years before I retire. I, 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 why would I want to change right now? I've got everything I set. Know. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is a sentiment that you hear from teachers a lot is, you know, well, I've been doing it this way. Why should I do anything differently? And so my response to that is that I think teachers are professionals right? We're professionals. We're, we go out into classrooms because we are the experts at what we do and we're the best at making learning happen. And so just as you would be horrified if you heard a doctor say, for example, well, you know, I've been using this medication to treat people for 30 years. I don't care what the current uh, technology is. I don't care what the current research says. You'd be very worried because there may be now ways to treat something in a more efficient way, in, um, in a way that results in better outcomes. And the same thing can happen in, in terms of education. And, and as teachers, we really have to embrace the fact that we are preparing students for a world that we do not understand. We don't know what things are going to look like. And so we can't kind of rest back and say, well, I've been doing it this way because we need to give our students the best shot at being successful in whatever the world lo looks like 15 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, because it certainly looks different than it did 10 years ago. But, but Corinne, you know, I've heard this thing about social media that it's bad because people can get in there <laughs> and, and they can say bad things about me. Why would I want to yeah. teach something in an environment where somebody can, can say bad things about me? Yeah. You know, a lot of people have this fear of social media and there's an element of truth to it. I mean, there's a lot of negative uh, things out there on social media. There are some things that can be dangerous on social media. And that has led to things like school districts blocking access to certain websites. Or I know when I was classroom teaching, I couldn't access YouTube, for example, in my classroom. And it always drove me crazy because I thought, here's all these great things on YouTube that I want to share with my students. And I can't because it's being blocked by the district. We have to accept that pretending like social media doesn't exist or refusing to engage in it ourselves or refusing to engage it in the classroom will not make it go away. Students are still gonna access social media. They'll just do it outside of your classroom. They'll do it on their own time. And the vast majority of students, even in uh, communities that are historically underserved, that don't have a lot of resources, even in those communities, 
the vast majority of students do have access to the internet somehow, even if it's just over a mobile phone. So they're gonna, they're gonna access it somewhere and somehow, and we need to prepare them to do that effectively. We can't just stick our heads in the sand. And my personal favorite. But, but Corinne, nobody else in my school is doing this stuff. Why should I be the one to stick my neck out? Because the very best teachers are teachers who lead their peers. They don't just stay in their own classroom. They don't just stay in their silo and say, this is the way that I'm going to do things. They say, I am going to push the forefront of what can be done in education so that we're giving students the very best that they can get in terms of an educational experience. And we have the opportunity to try to um, close some gaps with this technology. We have uh, the chance to expose students to things that they would never be able to experience. And if we don't take advantage of that, I, I think that's teacher malpractice. Wow. I'm going to probably try to use that one for the, for the, for the, uh, for the, for the podcast title right there. Please Te- do. Teacher malpractice. <laughs> I like that. Please okay. Do. So welcome back to the podcast here. We just got done role playing a little bit, but seriously, let, let's just kind of dive into all these topics because you can yeah. clearly see these are real conversations that are happening. These are yeah. real things that are, that are going on. You know, I, I find them in, in my role. Others, you know, tech coaches find them in their roles. Clearly these are things that are out there and, and, and honestly, Corinne, I could have kept going for the next hour, right? Oh, I know. I, 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 I was so, <laughs> so close to I. saying things like, but my college never taught me this. And, yes. and so can we put a definition behind this, this podcast here? Because sure. the term digital literacy, I know, at least in my environment, gets confused with digital citizenship. Are those two different things? Yeah. So when we talk about digital literacy... What we're really talking about is the skills, the behaviors, the abilities to be able to use a wide variety of different types of digital devices effectively. And when we're talking mm. about digital devices, though, we're, we're talking specifically about things that are connected to the larger world. We're not just talking about... Um, you know, you can you can play effectively with a Nintendo DS, right? Because right. that's not digital literacy. We're talking about being connected to the internet. We're talking about right. being connected to the global network of knowledge. That is what we really mean by digital literacy. Um, now, when we, you know, you'll find varying definitions of these things, um, and and you will hear people use digital literacy and digital citizenship interchangeably. Um, you know, when you talk about digital citizenship, I see it more as your ability to um, to be a steward of the world, to be connected to and moving forward in a progressive way with what's going on in the world. And not, um, you know, not just talking about, well, how do you use the technology, but really, what are you using the technology for? Yeah. I think that's really a a, a significant difference between when we're talking about just being digitally literate versus being a digital citizen. And, and, and you get that, right? You, you have in any community, but let's take a school district. You have Mm -hmm. the early adopters who are those who are out there. You know, you, you heard the term connected educator or, or first, all those, I try this. I have that maybe because they're on social media, they have a connection to, that company they've they've met them they've had a communication with them or maybe they've heard a blog post say top 10 ways to use and they're picking through their tools then you have this middle group of people that are the second wave right like i know my my fifth grade teacher over there is trying this thing let me see what it is yes and those are the teachers that come to me and they're like you know, I, I don't know anything about it, but can you share this with me? Or I want to do this particular skill with this tool. Is it the right one? And I love those middle people because they're trying to be pro- progressive in their classroom, trying to work with their students, but they're also at the same time, they're, they're, you know, they're taking that chance. They're reaching yeah. out to, to tech coaches like myself and to others and saying, I want to learn. I'm just not sure how. Then right. you have the third wave, which is, no, you, you'll you'll never get me to do this. I'm not a technology person like you are. Yes. One philosophy as a tech coach is you say, we focus on those who want and need and let everybody else catch up. 
Mm -hmm. I don't have that philosophy because no matter what, each of those groups of teachers has students in front of them. Yes. And and you have to say, all right, where is this? You know, I, I... I worked with a teacher last year who basically was against everything I was trying until finally one day we had a conversation and this person looks at me and you, you saw the wall break and it was, I, I, I don't know how to share a Google Doc with anybody. Mm-hmm. And it was an amazing moment because finally we were able to connect on what that platform was and we became BFFs for the rest of the year and, and, and beyond. It, it, it How can we get all teachers involved in digital literacy because this is not about the teachers this is about all the students so i think that there there's two big issues here one is that yes we do need to get all teachers interested in digital literacy we want them to all be motivated to do this but i i don't all actually think that it should be a choice i think that it's you know much in the same in the same way that we would say well if you're an elementary school teacher, you can't just decide you don't like teaching math and so you don't teach math. I think we have to treat technology integration the same way. It's, it's not that you have to have every single lesson that you do be high tech and get rid of all of the more traditional lessons that you've been doing, but that every teacher needs to be well-versed in how to become digitally literate. So I think we need to come at getting teachers involved from from two different angles. So one, from the angle that it is a necessity. This isn't an optional thing. It is now in state standards. It is a part of the careers that students are going to engage in. It is a part of just the world in general now, is being digitally literate. Um, And then also from the perspective that this can make your teaching more fun for you. It can make it more engaging for your students. It can make it more impactful in a shorter period of time. And so I think when you can have the more tech savvy, the more naturally motivated towards technology teachers, go ahead and jump in with both feet and take some risks and do some things that are interesting, do some things that are, end up being effective, and then bring that evidence to the table and show it to teachers and say, look, here is this thing that I did, and it only involved this amount of technological knowledge, and you can do it too. I think I think that's a great way to get them engaged. I think all also a really great way to get teachers engaged like this who are very reluctant is to say, let's find the thing that you enjoy teaching the most. Let's find your lesson that you really love to teach. Let's find, let's take that lesson and just find a little way that we can tweak it. Let's just add a little element to it. Maybe it's that they take the lesson and now the students take their final products and they put it out online somehow. Maybe they take something that used to be a, uh, presentation, a live presentation in the classroom, and maybe they're on YouTube. That, that, maybe that's a first step. So I don't think it has to be everything all at once, but I think there are a lot of ways to make connections and a lot of ways to, to show that not only is it something that we want teachers to be motivated to do, but that they really have to do. You know, I find when working with teachers of all grade levels, one of the biggest fears that they have is not knowing as much of, as the students. And mm-hmm. so I, you know, I don't want to expose myself to my students as being someone inferior or weak or mm-hmm. less knowledgeable. How can we get teachers beyond that and just say, look, sometimes and we use this phrase, right? Like the, the smartest person is the room. But if, if we're in a room full of 14 year olds, it's okay that the, that those kids have the skills, let them help you, let them teach you, mm-hmm. let them show you how to make your lessons. Be- that doesn't mean that you're a bad teacher. That just means that you're accepting that there are things out there that you want to learn. And maybe it is a 14 year old who knows how to Snapchat or tweets or Facebook or YouTube. How, how can we get, teachers to kind of let their guard down and accept that we're all here to learn from each other? Well, I think the safe and the comfortable is oftentimes the enemy of good teaching and real significant learning. And I think that goes for both teachers and students. So if we as teachers want our students to take risks and we want them to do things that are 
out of their comfort zone and we want them to really push themselves further, then we have to be willing to do that as teachers. We have to model that behavior. And given that we're coming in and being content experts most of the time in whatever we're teaching, you know, I might know a whole lot about English, for example, if I'm an English teacher, this is an opportunity for me to model to my students how to be a lifelong learner. This is an opportunity for me to model that not knowing how to do one thing doesn't mean that you are an ignorant person in general. It's not anything to be embarrassed of. And we can show them how to actually go about taking on new skills over the course of your lifetime. So I think it also goes back to your general teaching philosophy. If you're the kind of teacher who likes to stand in front of the room and have control all the time, and you're afraid of that, uh, afraid of letting go of that control, then it's going to be harder for you. But really, the research shows us very clearly, and experience, I think, for a lot of us shows us very clearly that students learn better. And teaching is a more engaging and rewarding experience when you can have a community of learners working together instead of having this old sage on the stage model of the teacher in the front of the room reading out their PowerPoint slides or just talking at the students and the students all taking notes. I think, I think we can really, and maybe we need to do a better job of this at, at all levels, we can really show teachers that this is a this pursuit of digital literacy among ourselves and among our students is something that adds value, not just to the student's experience, but to our experience as educators. It makes our jobs better. It makes our jobs more engaging. It makes them, uh, it makes what we do more effective. You know, just curious, when we're looking at digital citizenship and mm -hmm. digital literacy, I will I'll keep it at that too. And we're saying, why aren't schools moving forward in these directions? Do you think it's out of ignorance or do you think it's out of fear or a combination? I think it's both. I really think it's both because I think that you do have, you have the side of things that is fear related where instructors and administrators are afraid of what will students access if we give them access to the internet? What will they do? We'll lose control of the classroom if we allow them to have their devices with them or whatever it is. But I think that fear really stems from ignorance because it's this approach to technology of we don't fully understand it or all we know are the horror stories and so we'll just say that students can't have access to it all or we won't you know teachers won't won't be using it at all because we're we're worried about what could happen so i think that the fear and the ignorance really go hand in hand i i don't think it's malicious i think it's just a matter of um you know people not really knowing what to do with it and i think I think, a, I think a part of that is on us as schools of education that we haven't done a great job historically in preparing teachers to teach with technology. And I think the teaching profession as a whole doesn't necessarily do a great job of providing both high quality professional development and time for teachers to engage I, I, in uh, professional development. I, absolutely. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a position up here where I do have colleges and universities um, that I'm close with. And at times they might bring me in to talk to their, their student population about things like digital citizenship, digital literacy, social media, all these different topics. And I, I remember going into one school and I said, well, what do you guys think about social media and Facebook? And somebody raised their hand and said, you know, my professor tells me Facebook is bad and I should take all of my stuff off of it because it's not going to get me anywhere. Oh. And, and I, and I, ugh, you know, I did one of those, no, Facebook is is how you're going to get your job because someone's going to look at that and see yeah. that you're trying to reach out and be the expert and that you're and 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 you just said it, right? And and please come come at me with this from the professor point of view. Should we be teaching students, especially the pre-educator students, um about social media? Should we be teaching them about this stuff? I, I personally believe that I don't think colleges prepare teachers. I've had a, like the concept of a resume d is a piece of paper to most of these kids. My concept of a resume is your digital portfolio, which is your, it is your Twitter, your Facebook, your YouTube, your blogs, your blah, 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 all those like that is your resume much more than a two piece of two sheet of paper, right? 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when I was prepared as a, as a teacher, as a classroom teacher, I, I made my portfolio and it was a binder. It was a notebook. <laughs> and when I went to interview for jobs, I walked in and I put it on the desk and they just kind of looked at it like, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And, and it really didn't do anything for me. And I didn't really learn in my undergraduate teacher education program how to implement this. I, I learned some of the very basic stuff. At that time, it was Netscape, you know, I mean, you're building in, uh, stuff on Netscape. But, uh, you know, I think now you're, we're seeing that some schools of education are doing a stellar job. There really are. They, they are preparing students, preparing pre-service teachers to use technology in active ways. And I think that's key. It can't just be that the teacher is at the front of the room and they're reading off of a PowerPoint. Yes, technically that is using technology, but that is not going to allow students to become digitally literate. It's not using technology in active ways. Um, I think we do have schools of education that are doing a good job of this. They're, um, they're modeling mm -hmm. for students through the professors how to use technology. Um, that's one thing I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take the courses that I teach to my pre-service teachers and say, okay, instead of, you know, you have five papers due over the course of the term and you're going to write them in a Word doc and turn them in. Well, now what we do is we do one paper over the course of a term, but we do it um, in addition to a video project, in addition to a Prezi concept map that goes over the course of a term. And when you do write your paper, you do it in a Google Doc over the course of the term. And I check in with you every week and I look at what you've added and we have a conversation on that paper. And so, you know, we can model things like this for our pre-service teachers and we can show them, hey, here are ways to actively engage with your students in technology. And here are ways that your students can then join with this global body of knowledge because now these prezies that my students have created, for example, around learning theory, those are accessible to my future students yep. and they'll continue to be accessible to my students when yep. they progress through the rest of the program and when they're teaching in their classrooms. So now it's not a, you know, a dead PowerPoint that nobody's ever going to see again. Yep. It's something we can continue to engage with because it's this living, breathing thing. And we have to do a good job of modeling that. A absolutely. And, and I, I, I sometimes stop using the word resume and I, I exchange it with the term mark. <laughs> it, it's a marketing tool, right? It is. Every day is. you're building, like for, for me as an example, this show we're doing right here is just as much my resume as the piece of paper that you look at or my website, right? And mm -hmm. to get the students, but especially to get the educators to realize every single thing we do, you know, I, I tend not to use the word portfolio because yeah. That that that's pigeonholing things. I I want to get your opinion on something here. I the last couple of days I spent doing a boot camps, long form PD, which was we had a great time. But at the end, I was talking to one of the new teachers, um, somebody who just off just got a graduate diploma, right? Like the whole deal, and and she says. Would you rather be in a situation you are now where we don't have a one-to-one -one environment or would you rather be teaching in a one-to-one -one environment? And I thought about that and my, my answer was more from the technical point of view. And I, I said, like, look, we've got 3,000 people in our district and we have two techs. If, if we had one-to-one, -one, those techs are going to be more fix this every single day, fix this, fix yeah. this, fix this. Because we're technically not one-to-one, -one, they kind of have, like, look, we don't have 40 techs, right? We only have so, many, so much manpower to go around. Yes. I, I'd like to amend that answer and say if we were in a one-to-one -one where you are given this Chromebook or you are given this whatever – are we doing a disservice to those students because they're not learning Windows, Mac, Google, Chrome, Office, Apple? That is digital literacy, being able to be a cross-platform human, not just mm -hmm. I know Google Apps or I know Office right. 360. What, what, what would your answer? I mean, do you believe in a system where it is I am Office, I am Google, or we should be preparing everybody for everything? I mean, you had said you're doing Prezi. Cool. Yeah. I've never met a professional that needs Prezi, but you're teaching them the skill of exactly. organizing and, and manipulating and video editing and, and, and you just happen to be doing it through Prezi. You never know. Prezi might close in a year and you've got to take those skills elsewhere. How, how do you feel about it? Should we be pigeonholed into a one-to-one, -one, you know, technology singular thing? Well, I think that if, 
you try to pe teach people a particular technology, then that is where you're going to end up investing a lot of resources in something that is potentially going to not exist, as you say. It potentially is not going to exist by the time they may actually need to use it. And so, for example, when I teach when I teach my classes and I have my students use Prezi, we'll, we'll use that as an example, I don't actually do a lot of instruction with them on how to use Prezi. I say, here's some resources that you can engage with to learn how to use Prezi yourself because I want them to not only learn Prezi just for our class, but I want them to learn to use new technologies. I want them to learn to learn. And so I think there's this misconception among people who are not very tech savvy or who are not very digitally literate that there are groups of people who just know everything related to the technology and you know they know everything about Prezi and if you don't know what they know then you can't do it. When in reality, and I think you'll find this backed up by most people who work in any kind of tech situation, is that a good percentage of what you do when you are troubleshooting or you're figuring out how to do something new is you're Googling it. Yep. Even if you're the tech professional, yes. you're Googling it. Yep. So, and, and so when my students come to me and they'll ask me a question about Prezi, maybe 40% of the time, I have no idea what the answer is to their question. I go find out the answer myself, I Google it, and then I share with them where I found the information. And I say, I went onto the Prezi website and I went to this and I looked at that and here's what I found. And I'm hoping to try to break down that idea yeah. that we have to become an expert in the particular tool or in the particular technology as opposed to having this open approach yeah. to technology where you can just experiment. You can Try and Google it, and you can see what happens. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, e even w w with every time I walk into a classroom with kids or I do PD training with teachers, there's always two things I kind of subtly force upon the room, which is number one, know your keyboard shortcuts because you speed up. <laughs> yes. um, and, and, and generally, I find that sometimes I'll just stop what I'm doing and I'll say, okay, Command Z is, Command C is, and we will just, and you realize that the kids are picking this stuff up. The mm -hmm. teachers want to write down that information. And I'm like, no, don't just, just say it with me. Pretend that we're two years old. And the other thing I always throw in there is Google search or Bing mm -hmm. search or whatever. You know, the idea that you can go into an Omnibox and type in weather colon Louisiana, and there it is. You don't have to... Yes. Right or maps dot or two from you know to the two and just simple things like to and from when doing your Gmail search, um, yeah. I mean, all of that stuff just kind of comes into this, and that's that's where I think teachers, rightfully so, their head just explodes. I try to come at this and go, look, I'm not, you know, I'm giving this to you in small bits. I'm saying, you know. Uh, a clean inbox is a happy inbox. And I love it when I walk down the hallways and I see teachers saying that phrase to your kids. Like, I'm trying to teach your students through you. And so, you know, we do like a clean inbox is a happy inbox. Or my other favorite is, oh, did you know that Google's a search company? Because every time that people say, well, where's that button for? I say, <laughs> well, did you know that G Google does search really well? And then they yep. get frustrated. And I give, I have a little uh, uh, search PowerPoint thing that I have made up. Um, but yeah, you know, I want to hit one more topic with you. And by the way, thank you yeah. so much. Today we're talking to Dr. Corinne Hyde um, from USC Rossier School of Education in California. In, in, is that right? Yes, it's in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Um, and, and before I let her go, and by the way, you're, you're coming back on the show later. We're just, we're just going to call that that. We're having so much of a good time here. Sounds let's like plan. Let's definitely do this again because I, I, I don't want to make a three hour show here yet. Um, <laughs> the elephant in the room for every educator. We've talked about it a little bit, but social media, right? Yes, I, I, yes. I look at Twitter as one of those, if I need something, Twitter is my encyclopedia. It's my library. It's my, you name it. Um, I use it in school. I use it for everything. I, I say I, I wouldn't be where I am with my job and I wouldn't be mm -hmm. where I am with teacher cast and the podcasts are without Twitter, which is why, I hope that stock price stays high. So with all of those things going on, you know what? I'm just going to open it up because there, there's so many different questions going on. You're the expert here. Educators, social media, students, social media, boundaries, guidelines. I don't know where I'm going with this, but yeah. give me some opinions and some advice on this. 
Well, so I would say, first off, I try to end every time I, I teach a class with my pre-service teachers with some advice to them about going forward into this profession of teaching, which is just challenging and rapidly changing. And the number one piece of advice that I always give them is that they need to build a professional learning network. They need to build a personal learning network. And what that means for them really is being engaged with social media, because as much as we would all love to work in a school where our room part our best friend and they're philosophically aligned with our teaching approach and there's somebody who can challenge us and push us forward every day and have all the information we need. That's not reality, right? I mean, you might get lucky and have good connections with the people around you, but you might not. And they're still, even if they're the greatest ally in the world, they're only going to present you with one very small perspective on teaching and learning. If we want to be really robust 21st century educators, we have to build a personal learning network that expands outside of our classroom, outside of our floor, outside of our school, outside of our district. And we have to find the people that challenge us, that support us, make connections to things that we've never seen before. And the only way to do that really effectively is with social media. And so that means that we have to, as educators, become literate with social media. And you become literate with social media by using it. So you need, you need to get on Twitter. You need to get on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is. You need to connect with other people who are at the cutting edge of your profession around the world. And you do that through social media. And when we want students to be able to use social media effectively, we can't teach them to do that unless we are experienced with social media ourselves. So we need to be able to explicitly teach them about it. Yes, they may understand more about hashtags than you do, but that does not mean that they understand more about creating a digital identity and what that means and whether it should be the same or different than the identity that they present to their friends when they're hanging out with their friends or to their parents or whoever. We have a lot of knowledge about inhabiting these different roles as adults. We've all done it, right? We understand, okay, well, you are presenting a certain face to people when you're just sitting in your living room hanging out and you're presenting a different face to people when you are teaching a class and when you are with your children or whatever it is. You present these different sides of yourself and we understand as adults, most of us, we understand which of those sides are appropriate to present in which different situations. And young people don't know that naturally. They have to learn it. Now, I consider myself very fortunate that I was able to learn that before the internet and social media <laughs> was a big thing, because now all of my mistakes are not preserved online for everyone to access forever. But for our young people right now, if they make a mistake on social media in that respect, that can follow them forever. And so we really do have to explicitly teach, okay, mm -hmm. think about who can access this content. If it's on Twitter, it's likely public and if you go to apply for a job in 10 years, whatever you put on there could pop up. So let's think about what you put on Twitter and how that might represent your public identity to the world. We need to be teaching students about building their own personal brand from the time that they're in middle school and they can first get online. You know, there's so many different topics that we can do. And even in that little bit that you just gave me, I'm thinking of three or four different shows. Yes. Um, <laughs> we could talk about this for like days. Yeah. No, no, no. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm working on a whole branding workshop and series and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at student branding at this point from a, a marketing point of view. You know, I, I, I look at all of this stuff and we can call it educational, but I just find the more that I, I talk about these things, it really is marketing. You know, I've been to interviews where when the, when the person, and says tell me about yourself I just sat there and the other people at that table that were interviewing me spoke up and gave my own bio yeah. because they had listened to the podcast or they had followed me or they and and you know you get into a position where you it just it, it clicks and you go well why didn't we do this earlier why didn't we know about this now look there's obviously a deep dark side to branding and to social media and, and, Absolutely. you know, we can do that show too, please. But there's, a, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there, there's, there's so much in there that what, what do you think? Do the positives outweigh the negatives? Are, are people like you and I just, 
we know not to get into the negatives or have the negatives not caught up to us yet? So I think, I think the question, honestly, about whether the positives outweigh the negatives is almost irrelevant because it, 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 it just is. We can't, we can talk to students all day long about, you know, if we decide that the negatives outweigh the positives, we can tell them, well, just don't go on social media. But that's the, the abstinence only approach to social media is not going to work. You have to teach students how to effectively use social media because it is not going anywhere. So I personally, though, do think that the positives far outweigh the negatives. I think that if we teach students to use these things effectively and to be very careful about what they add to their their public identity, and then there's an opportunity for them to make these really incredible connections to uh, have experiences that they would never have had an opportunity to engage in without social media. But that involves us becoming literate as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously. Of course. <laughs> um, Cur- Curran, thank you for coming on. But before I let you go, I, I-, I want to do something that I-, I rarely do on on this particular show that I do, that the Teacher Cast podcast. I usually re- reserve this for another one of my my shows. But I, I have a-, a little challenge for my guests. And, and I- it's a series of five questions that I call the Jersey Five Things okay. to get you thinking. Would you be interested in taking the challenge today? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Five questions. Each of them get a little bit harder. And, okay. um, you know, if you start to sweat a little bit, I understand. Many many people have <laughs> failed this one. Um, your favorite Twitter account to follow or hashtag to follow and why? Okay. My favorite hashtag to follow, I, I guess I'm going to be nerdy here is just ed tech because I, this is my field. I love to see what's happening and there's always, there's always good resources being posted about what people are doing. That's cutting edge. So that's, that's always the first thing that I search when I go on Twitter. Favorite educational tool to use, to teach from, to talk about somewhere in that umbrella. So I would say that would be Adobe connect. Um, I mm. think Adobe Connect, it, it does have a couple of, of weak spots when it comes to teaching and learning, but I think right now it is, it's far and above the best way for us to deliver live, engaging, synchronous virtual class sessions at a distance. And I think that is really, if we can adopt this technology and technologies like it more and more and more, um, I think that it really opens up education to a lot of people who have not previously been able to engage in certain types of education and certain certain topics. And, and I think there's a lot of ways that we can can emulate the Adobe Connect thing too with things even like free, free tools like Google Hangouts, for example. So the next one's open-ended just because I'm always speaking with different people, but it's best advice you have ever been given as a, and sometimes I say as a podcaster, as an educator, as a mother, as a, but best <laughs> advice you've ever been given as a, and fill in the blank, what's, whatever's appropriate. I think the best advice that I've ever been given, really in general, it, related to anything, is fail a lot. And what that means really is that when you when you rack up a lot of failures at things, it doesn't mean that you are a failure. It means that you've taken a lot of risks. It means that you've pushed the boundaries of things. It means that you have you've really tried to go above and beyond. If you don't have any failures under your belt, then you're living in a very safe and comfortable place and you're not doing anything new and interesting. I I could end this right there. That's pretty cool. All right. You got two more though. Um, And again, this is kind of open-ended. So I'm trying to, trying to put these into, into your seat here. What do you hope your students remember about you when they graduate at the end of the year? But if you want to change that to whatever fits you, please do. Yeah, I think, um, well, like I said, I mostly teach pre-service teachers and I, I get them right at the very beginning of our, of our program and they, you know, they go out and they graduate and they become classroom teachers. And so I think the number one thing that I would want them to remember about me is that I, I really do care for them and I want them to come back and rely on me for support, even if it's 20 years from now in their teaching career, uh, that they should 
I, I mean, who knows what, how they will contact me at that point, probably a hologram in my living room, right? But uh, that they should reach out and they should contact me and let me continue to support them and keep, keep this professor-student relationship strong because I don't think it has to end when you leave the classroom. And finally here, and, and this is the hard one, what is the best teachable moment you've ever had? <laughs> Gosh, that is really hard. Um, the best teachable moment I've ever had. Um, let's see. Wow, the best teachable moment I've ever had. I, You know, I would say probably for me, the best teachable moment for me was um, when I, when I first became a teacher, I went in to teach in, uh, in a high needs school in uh, near East, East LA. And I definitely went in with kind of a, um, kind of a savior mentality. Like I was going to come in and I was going to, I was going to save these kids. Right. Uh, and I, I learned very quickly that that was, uh, that was a whole lot of white privilege talking and that the, these students, they didn't, they didn't need me to come in and save them. They had brilliant educators. They were working with them all the time. And I was for the first time in an environment where I was, um, where most of the people around me didn't look like me. And I think it, it ended up being an incredible teachable moment for me over the course of my whole teaching career there, because I had to learn to just be quiet and, and to listen and to accept that I'm not the one coming in with all the answers all the time. And so I think that has helped me with my students as well to try to just be quiet and listen uh, sometimes and, and not be the one with all the answers. My guest today is fantastic. Um, Corinne, where can we go to find out more about you? And uh, I'm assuming that you have a, a website, an email or a Twitter, right? I do. Yes. So there's a couple of different things that I would direct you to. So, um, so the first thing I would say, um, just related to what we've been talking about here today, um, there's, um, a guide to Pinterest for educators that we've developed out of, um, Rossier, um, out of the USC Rossier School of Education. Um, and, uh, that website is great because it talks about all of these things that we've been talking about, um, how to really get connected and, um, get students to become digitally literate. And so I think that's an excellent resource. I would strongly encourage everybody to, to check that out. My personal website is edspiration.net, um, E-D-S-P-I-R-A-T-I-O-N.net. Um, you can check me out there. And on Twitter, I'm uh, at Dr. Corinne Hyde, D-R Corinne Hyde at twitter.com. You know, getting back to the the, the, the Pinterest for educators, I, I, I do want to say to everybody, it's a fantastic guide. I we, we put everything from TeacherCast out onto Pinterest, but I, I I don't do Pinterest. I don't know much about it. And searching through here, it, it really taught me a lot about Pinterest and how to use it and where to go. Um, bring that back one more time here, Corinne. What can we find into this? It's called the Guide to Pinterest for Educators. Yeah, so, you know, Pinterest has you know, half a million different pins related to education. And so if you're an educator, that can be very overwhelming when you go on Pinterest uh, to try to find these resources. And so what this guide does is it breaks it down for you into a handbook that tells you, it's literally broken up into like, here's how to get your students to collaborate. Here's how to stay organized. Here's how to make sure that students are safe on the internet. Um, it breaks it down into all of these different categories, and then you can access these different categories and figure out um, the best ways to actually use technology to help your students become digitally literate. It's fantastic. It, it really is worth some, you know, carve out an hour and, and check this thing out. Um, Pinterest is one of those amazing little social media networks that you do get lost in all the pictures. You do get yes. lost in finding things. Um, much like people can say, "I don't get Twitter; it just moves." And I'm, then you have to learn how to, how to speak the language of Twitter and Facebook. You, you have to kind of learn a little bit about, about Pinterest. But, y you know, if you want to learn about STEM education, there's no better place to go for these little STEM games than Pinterest. It's visual. It's there. It's searchable. It's fantastic. Um, check it out. Uh, the Guide to Pinterest for Educators. We will certainly have the links in our show notes over on teachercast.net, and we can certainly go through that. Uh, one more time, Corinne, your website is... Uh, my website is edspiration.net, E-D-S-P-I-R-A-T-I-O-N.net. And, and we can find you on Twitter at? 
Dr. Corinne Hyde, Dr. Corinne Hyde. Excellent. Corinne, thank you so much. I hope this isn't the last time we speak to each other. And uh, please, this is a, an open door policy we have here on TeacherCast. Please invite yourself on anytime. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. This was great. Thank you so much. And thank you out there for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. There's a lot of great things happening here as we start the school year. We're going to be doing some amazing co uh, contact work, both in the Microsoft and the Google environments. We've got some stuff talking about HyperDocs coming up and the new Google Classroom features. If you are out there and you're an educator, you need to be checking out the great stuff that we have on TeacherCast. Just as a reminder, there are there is a change in our schedule. The Tech Educator Podcast is moving from Sunday nights into Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock. We're going to be doing that starting the second week in September. We hope that you can enjoy it. Uh, we love our live audience and we love anybody that participates in all of that. Of course, you can check us out on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us with all of your questions, concerns, and tell us why you love Corinne over at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And you can, of course, find us on all of your podcasting channels on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker Radio, uh, you name it. And of course, please do a subscribe to us over on iTunes and on YouTube. We certainly love it when you check us out over there. Again, my name is Jeff Bradbury from the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.